Hello, let me read to you from James chapter 2 and verses 8 to 13. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You can't accuse James of being lightweight or superficial in this letter. He's writing to Christians from a Jewish background who know the scriptures very well, but they seem to have lost the plot as far as putting their faith into practice is concerned. He gave us lots of practical challenges in chapter one. Here in chapter two, he's tackling the huge issue of favoritism towards the rich, which he says is both ungodly and foolish. And now he goes seriously deep in his challenge and we need to go with him for a little while. Verses eight to 13 deal with three huge themes which we can't afford to get wrong. Here they are, law, judgment, and mercy. And the passage raises questions, I think, in our minds. What is this royal law? Why is it called royal? What is the judgment referred to? Is it the final judgment? And where does mercy come in? Does that fit with law and judgment? Let me help you get into this passage by reminding you of James's scathing comment in verse four of this chapter. Have you not become judges with evil thoughts? You see, they'd made two massive mistakes. First of all, they set themselves up as judges. We, not God, will decide who to favour. And then having set themselves up as judges, they got the judgment wrong. They acquitted the guilty and condemned the innocent. So James is still saying that favouritism is wrong, but now he gives maybe the biggest reason why. In these six verses, we get a reference to law four times, law breaking three times, two specific laws are mentioned, and judged or judgment is mentioned three times. So some questions arise in our minds, I think. Um, first of all, about making the law. Um, what is this law and who is it for? What's its purpose? And James tells us it's a royal law. And I think very simply with the background of Jesus' teaching, he's saying this is kingdom law. It's the law of the kingdom of God. And he tells us also in verse 8 that it's found in scripture. And it's from the mouth of God. See that in verse 11. He said, he said. And the purpose of it is to give freedom. That's a massive subject, isn't it? How the law brings freedom. So that's about break, making the law, but he also talks about breaking the law. Well, James says, showing favouritism breaks the law. Simple as that. And don't come back to me with your excuse, oh, but I keep the rest of the law. No, it's one law. You break part of it, you break all of it. A little bit like a, a pane of glass. It's only broken in one place, but the whole window shatters. Or, or a bucket uh, with water in it. It's only got one small hole, but all the water will drain out. Or a chain. Only one le link is broken, but the whole thing will cease to work. A and he reminds us also that we're breaking the king's law and will be judged by the same law. Show no mercy, receive no mercy. Now let's just step back for a moment from this uh, passage about law and law breaking and judgment and ask ourselves, what do those words say to us? Where, where do they take us in the Bible? And I think they honestly, they take us to the whole Bible story from start to finish. Just think of the Garden of Eden. Well, there was a law, wasn't there? One tree was prohibited, don't eat. And the law was broken, they did eat, and so judgment fell. Uh, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Or we could be on Mount Sinai, where the law is given, the law of Moses. And this is the covenant agreement that God makes with his people. And for the laws, there are penalties. Or we could be listening to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about the law as being firstly inward. God sees our hearts. Our obedience to the law starts in our hearts. Or best of all, we're at the cross, where Jesus 
becomes a curse. Cursed is everyone who does not obey. He becomes a curse for us. He suffers the full penalty of the lawbreaker, even though he has never broken the law. So this is the big Bible story. It's the story of salvation. It seems to me it's what James's readers had lost. Law, sin, judgment, God's love and mercy and our response to love God and love our neighbour. So let me try and sum this up a little bit. What, what, what have we learned? What is James teaching us in this passage? Well, three things strike me. First of all, God alone is the lawgiver and God alone is the judge. They set themselves up as judges. No, he says, this is God's law. You'll be judged by God's standards. Then secondly, he's very explicit. The law of the kingdom is love your neighbour. And that reflects exactly what Jesus says. Jesus says, doesn't he, that, that love God, love your neighbour sums up all the law and the prophets. Break the, first, the second, love your neighbour, and you've broken the first. Favouritism, you break the law. In principle, it's just as serious as murder or adultery. <coughs> and the third thing that we learn here is that mercy triumphs over judgment, and that, that is the gospel. Just think of those places that I took you to a moment ago, the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, God says, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Mercy will ultimately triumph over judgment. Think of Mount Sinai. The people had come into this place where they were heading for the promised land, but they'd already been rescued. God had already shown them mercy and grace, undeserved favour. Mercy had triumphed. And Jesus, as he talks about uh, the, the law being an inward thing, we know that in his life he fulfilled the law. He comes as an act of love and mercy towards us and he fulfills the law in our place. And finally on the cross, that is that place where wrath and mercy meet. Jesus, out of mercy and grace, suffers the penalty of the law for us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's a great truth, isn't it? It is the heart of the gospel. And it's something that we sing, actually, quite often. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful cold soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Or a more recent uh, song. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Let me quote you two verses, if I may, uh, from uh, a, a favourite hymn of mine by John Newton. Uh, Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Saviour's name. He has hushed the Lord's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us with his blood. He has brought us near to God. And then this. Let us wonder. Grace and justice join and point to mercy's store. When through grace our trust in Christ is, justice smiles and asks no more. He who washed us with his blood has secured our way to God. Well, let me leave you with two questions, if I may, uh, for discussion and, and further thought. Uh, the questions in my mind, there may be other questions in yours. Uh, here's the first one. What really motivates you to serve God and does our motivation matter. I ask that because it feels a little bit here in this passage, although James is saying, love your neighbour because it's God's law and you should obey it. And if you don't, you'll come under God's judgment. Is that what he's saying? Why can't I just love others because God has loved me? Well, that's the first question. What really motivates you to serve God and does motivation matter? Second question about showing mercy. How can we show mercy to others? It's not a phrase we use very often. What does it mean? What opportunities do we have to do it? But it is something Jesus says, remember in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It seems to be a key part of kingdom living. So my question is, how can we show mercy to others? Are we being merciful in our lives today?